uh, Sunday morning. It is my pleasure to welcome you always to the morning seminars. We are here every single morning of the season, except on Mondays. We will not be here uh, Mondays because our marching orders are to come the morning after there are productions, and there are no productions on Sunday. Hence, we aren't here Monday, but we will be here Tuesday. I do want to announce that if you are staying over, the first props seminar of the season will be held tomorrow at 11 a.m. with our props director. No, they canceled it. I wonder why. Okay, who? Okay. Okay, so so we have to remain flexible in this life, and so I believe there is a prop seminar tomorrow. If not, just wander around the gift shop and find some item that you'd like to purchase or peruse. Anyway, enough of that. My name's Nancy Mielich, and I'm literary seminar director here at the festival. And as many of you know, the um, preview week and opening week, we are privileged to have the directors of the plays be our guests. And this morning is no exception. Sharon Ott, the director of King Lear, graciously agreed to spend an hour with us Sunday morning, and Sharon Ott is with us. The um, seminars, these literary seminars, are funded in part through the generosity of Tina and Larry Howard and Utah Humanities and we thank them for believing that you all want to come and talk about what you saw last evening, what you understood, what you didn't understand, uh, what Shakespeare intended, because you all knew exactly what he intended, correct? <laughs> and so um, that's what I like to do, is get a conversation going and, of course, uh, take advantage of the director being with us. Now, Sharon Ott, my goodness, what a, what a pleasure to have you here. Sharon is... Um, a director who has worked all over the country. She is the former artistic director of the Seattle Repertory Theater, as well as the Berkeley Repertory Theater. Currently uh, is teaching, and I don't know your official title in Savannah. Artistic director. Artistic director, she's gone south on us. And uh, she also uh, has directed at almost every major regional theater in this country and has um, directed here previously. Some of you might have seen her production, a uh, uh, very acclaimed artistic production of The Merchant of Venice here in 2010 with Tony Amendola as Shylock in that production. So that team of Tony Amendola and Sharon Ott are back here for, with us this season for King Lear. And I wanted to start off, Sharon, by asking you if, uh, when you were asked by the festival to direct King Lear, I assume that was the one you were offered, if not, correct me on that, and if you had the choice as to whom would be your Lear, since you are not the casting director for all of the, all of the company. Uh, well, David and Brian actually sort of told me everything they were doing and said which one appeals to you, and that was, I think they knew what my answer was going to be. Uh, so it was a choice actually for Tony and I to work together. So we were sort of a team going in on this one. Uh, because I knew when they asked me, I, I'd been thinking of doing Lear. It actually was, you know, in your director's life, you often have things that float onto your radar screen. And this was a play I had been talking about with Charlie Fee, who runs Idaho Shakespeare Festival and also Great Lakes in Cleveland. Uh, and that one didn't work out, and then it kind of surfaced again as an idea here. And Tony was the actor that all three of us, David, Brian, and I, wanted to play the role. Uh, and uh, the original idea uh, included Henry Warrenitz, who, those of you who saw uh, Henry IV Part I, you know that he played Falstaff last year. So the original idea was actually Tony and Henry together, uh, because both of them are, you know, probably, certainly from the Mississippi West, the two of them are probably the best known classical actors that we've got. Uh, and as, uh, I don't know if you all know this, but Henry's uh, partner, Fontaine Sire, was diagnosed with cancer and subsequently has passed away. So Henry has not been able to be in with us this summer. But Tony stuck with it. And this is actually the 
fourth Shakespeare I've done with Tony and the 13th production. So he and I have a long, long history together. Had, you, had either of you, had you directed Lear before or Tony, I don't believe, had ever played the role. Is nope. that correct? Both of us, first time. Okay. So then, um, stepping a little bit aside from the king, your production starts with the, the daughters on stage, uh, which you can tell us if that is um, where your focus was in doing this. What is the sensibility of the daughters to the father, the father to the daughters? And I also wanted to know if you'd ever discussed, are the daughters all from the same woman? Or are they, do they have different mothers? Uh, <laughs> well, the first question, uh, it's not real. The beginning isn't really meant to be that the production is going to focus on the daughters. But I did feel uh, that was a more intuitive response, I guess, to the play. And I wanted to have a feeling of the restlessness of the kingdom itself. Uh, the unsettled nature of the relationship between the three sisters. And also, quite frankly, I just wanted to get the fool out there <laughs> because Mr. Shakespeare <laughs> doesn't get him on for a while. And I just felt he has such a presence in the play that I wanted to have his aura on stage. Uh, and the, uh, the feeling between the sisters evolved i mean they all looked at me like oh no when i suggested this idea because it does mean they have to come early and you know they're working so hard here <laughs> uh and you could just see them their faces oh okay i have to be on stage 10 minutes before we start okay but it evolved into something that they really liked because they can get a little bit of a history of what's going on between them before the play starts and particularly for The Fool, it was very helpful to develop that relationship with Cordelia. Uh, and uh, we, so we built a history for these sisters. And I'm not sure if we all agreed on the fact that Cordelia might have a different mother. But I believe the actress playing Cordelia feels that way. Uh, that she, she, and this is my view as well, and I know Tony holds this view, that the mother of Goneril and Regan dies with Regan's birth, the poor second child. So Regan is sort of, she's kind of the one left out. Um, we think Lear actually respects Goneril. He doesn't love her, but he respects her because she has a lot of his genetic qualities. Um, and so there's a built-in respect for the eldest daughter and a, then a little bit of a fatherly distance from Regan because of what we've made up as their backstory. And then we think wife number two gave birth to Cordelia and also died in childbirth. But in our little version, Cordelia lives with her dad. The other two don't. Uh, and they've been summoned. They don't know precisely what for until that map appears. And then they start to get the picture. So that's what's going on there. But it's mostly just to have a, have a little sense. We had an image of them as panthers, as sort of prey animals that eventually the two sisters, when they're circling their dad and he's on his knees there before, oh, reason not the need, which I'm still going to work on because I don't think it's quite right yet. We want to feel like they're prey animals just about ready to pounce. But I, in terms of my focus on them, the other thing that I wanted to do, being a woman and having a father who is now passed on, but who was, I loved him dearly, but he was a tough cookie and a very, very uh, impulsive man. And I have one sister who's a little younger than myself, and we did have to manage him as he grew older. And so I wanted to have a sense that those daughters, Regan and Goneril, don't start out as the wicked stepsister types. They actually start out um, just with a problematic father who's made a problematic move, and they don't quite know what to do with him. And then as they go on, um, you know, they turn into people who, of course, are n don't have his best interests in mind and ultimately become very evil. But it was important to me that they not be seen that way from the beginning. That at the beginning, you actually get a sense of some, I wouldn't say compassion, but that you understand particularly Goneril's issue when he brings all those guys in who are drunk and throwing up in the household and bringing a lot of dead animals into the household and dancing and, you know, that, that, that it's a problem and they don't quite know what to do. 
uh, and I got a quite a sense of uh, I w I'm directing a play in DC later in the summer and I w went made my first visit to the Holocaust Museum which had a fantastic exhibit about the growth of Nazism and just watching how the German people who collaborated it was mostly about the collaborators not the real bad guys how how evil just snuck in and how they started to behave in ways that first seemed expedient to them and then eventually became purely evil but that the transformation was not necessarily felt by the people doing it so that's what we're trying to do with the two sisters who do throw him out that they're not they're not aware that they've made that turn into pure evil until it's too late and it's also um, I, I was aware of it last night that we have uh, Galster who has two sons one of whom both of whom he claims to love dearly one of uh, the, by different mothers and throws one of them out because of the what he suspects is happening and then we have Lear who has three daughters and throws the one who he loves the most out and I had never really thought so much about the parallel between those two characters and their parenting the, the relationship that Shakespeare has given both of them as parents. Did you talk much about that, or do you think much about that in the uh, rehearsal process or just in your own research? Totally. So I'm really glad you said that because uh, that means when Henry was cast, the reason we did that with both those strong actors, and I'm so glad that with wonderful Jamie Newcomb that survived, is that I always have felt the play was about both families. And the whole cutting of the play and the way it's arranged is to emphasize that, that it's not just a story of Lear and his daughters. It's the parallel story of Gloucester and his sons. And that Gloucester also has a, a different kind of rash behavior, a different kind of personality that doesn't get it, that he, he's not really looking at the full picture. He's acting on impulse, and it's equally catastrophic for him. So, yeah, that that's my hope through the whole production is that it's, equally balanced. Uh, Lear, of course, Gloucester, Shakespeare doesn't write the kind of uh, story for Gloucester in terms of being able to see him actually become an empathetic, loving human being at the end. You, you can't, we're trying to do that, but it's not really written into the play. But certainly the, the behavior with the sons, the sense of more than one child and more than one mother, uh, and uh, two fathers who who don't who behave in a rash and uh, illogical fashion. Okay, let's turn it over to you all for comments. Ah, uh, this is a uh, my my. I, I just want to say for myself, I I really enjoyed this production, and I've seen uh, several different ones. I thought you you assembled. Or, or the casting director, whoever assembled a very strong ensemble cast. Uh, I can't think of a, a weak person. Uh, it's a per, uh, special shout out, I think, goes to the actress who uh, played Cordelia and my uh, former student. Oh, really? Yay. Oh, <laughs> who, who was who, who was also uh, who was also really delightful in a completely different way in uh, Charlie's aunt earlier and. Uh, and to the actor who uh, played Gloucester, I just thought it has a, a real sincerity and a, na a naturalism uh, while still being very clear. And uh, my father, who could not make it to the seminar, uh, just called me <laughs> and said, you need to tell them that I thought that him throwing the eye out into the audience was too much. It was, <laughs> it was that, that they went into vaudeville. It was too crazy. What were they thinking? But per perhaps I'd be curious to he hear what other people thought about that, and what and what precipitated the decision to, to go that that to make it such a visceral experience for the audience. Well, the uh, you know I, I couldn't find my program note in the program. Is it in there? Do the, I, souvenir the souvenir pro. Okay, all right. Which comes out Monday. Okay. So the program. What I what I found really interesting about the play as I researched it, and it really informed uh, the scenic design. Excuse me, the scenic design and, and that moment, uh, was that the period when Shakespeare wrote this play was really the beginning of the Jacobean era. So the, uh, the whole division of the kingdom, that was actually something that James I is in his personal history. He wrote about that. 
And, you know, as all of you know who study Shakespeare, James I was the son of Mary, Queen of Scots, who had been beheaded by Elizabeth. So he had a, an unsteady sense of the crown, and uh, a lot of the feeling of the play mirrors the, the real transitional point between the Jacobean and the Elizabethan era. So the Jacobean-type characters include Edmund, who's a pure Machiavel. You know, he's, he's reflecting the worldview of, of the Jacobean society where the, uh, the sense of the Elizabethan age, of a greater being being part of the world, uh, the Jacobeans really weren't thinking about that. They were the beginning, you know, kind of rational scientific people who felt the end justified the means, it's all for what I want to do. And Goneril and Regan fall into that as well. So, and those of you who know Jacobean literature, the Duchess of Malfi, etc know that the i is like would be minor league <laughs> compared to the excesses of violence that you wind up with in the jacobean era with 15 people dead on stage and just a carnage show so i wanted to to go for the pure jacobean sense of that scene uh and when i was looking for a, a kind of visual inspiration and i guess um internal inspiration for the look of the play and the feel of the play. I thought, well, okay, what current things have a sense of a sort of culture that's in a cold, harsh land uh, where there's a ton of violence and families who are, who are fighting each other? Anybody know what that might be? Game of Thrones. So if you remember the Red Wedding scene in Game of Thrones, it doesn't, again, it's more violent and bloody than anything we put up there on stage. So I kind of went for all that. Uh, and a lot of the design is vaguely influenced by that, by the production design of that show, which, which I think is actually spectacular. So, you know, there's actually one direct ripoff, the candles on the table. That's actually from the Red Wedding. So that was why I wanted to do it, is I, I wanted to reflect 100% the, the kind of bloodthirsty, the, the love of that kind of graphic violence, which we have in our society today. You know, my feeling is we live in a somewhat Jacobean world, and our sense of entertainment is not that far off. Look at Quentin Tarantino, or it's right out of the Jacobean sensibility. So not only with the blood and guts, but with the continuing, I hope, and last night it felt like we got it, the, the play is funny in places. Surprisingly, ironically, darkly humorous. And that, again, is part of the Jacobean mentality, where, where the Jacobeans, the Elizabethans didn't see things at all that way. And, and sort of the end of the play is more Elizabethan with Lear. Even though it's dark, there is a sense that at least he reaches some kind of, um, depending on how your spiritual orientation lies, he reaches some sort of place of enlightenment. And the Jacobean character, even Edmund, kind of has to come around in the end to that point of view. That's the one that wins. But I think the drive in the play comes from that, that bloody, you know, let's go for it sensibility. I don't know. Anyone in the front row? Where did that eye go? Did you get it? Was it like at your feet? Yeah, we never know where it's going to go. And actually, last night, it was a little bit off because the blood packs didn't quite burst. So he was in there like <laughs> Cornwall was struggling a bit to get the face as bloody as he wanted before he got that eye. He's holding that eye. It's actually pretty hard to do because he has to kind of find it in a pocket pretend like he's getting his hand in there, break a blood pack, and then get it out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It, we thought so, too, that it would be an abstraction. But it took a while because it kept bouncing. We had, <laughs> we had to find the place. You know, the laughter is fine, but we didn't necessarily want everybody laughing at the eye bouncing around. <laughs> um, it, we don't often get here during the previews, so this is, this is great um because i we've seen lear multiple times at this festival so i wanted to mention one thing that i think is dangerous and two things that i think that, that didn't work for me and just see what you think mm -hmm. the the map somebody's gonna fall on that map and kill themselves 
uh, during the latter part of that scene when the, they started, it started to get folds in it. Uh, and I thought, oh, they're going to fall. I, I, so I was distracted by the thought that somebody's going to fall, is going to trip on that thing and hurt themselves. Second thing, um, maybe this is because you're teaching in Savannah now. When uh, Edgar goes into his summer. Arkansas accent, <laughs> it just is such a distraction. I mean, it, it was funny for a second, and then I thought, wait a minute. Anyway, and then, oh, and then the other thing is I thought um, the, the bandages looked too much like a pair of goggles, like a pair of goggles that you'd use to see a 3D movie in the olden days with red lenses in them. Somehow, it, it just didn't quite work for me. I mean, I love the production. The acting was phenomenal. The music really added something. But those are just some thoughts. Well, the, we're still working on that bandage. Uh, that's a sad thing to hear because we <laughs> it's really hard to do. We, we've, this is bandage number five. And the one before was bloody all across. And ha he has to have something under it so that he, he can see. Uh, so we had this thing, and it really looked like it looked like ski goggles because you could see the shape. Um, this one we're gonna try to. We thought this was closer, but we still just thought it was somewhat funny. So we're gonna try to mess it up so it doesn't look quite so much like what you think. It's a hard. It's just a hard prop to make work. So I'm glad to hear it still doesn't work. Edgar's. It's actually supposed to be North Georgia. It's a deliverance country, <laughs> uh, but Arkansas isn't bad. You know we're. We're, I don't know, that is, I can, I understand that that might be too far for some people, but I've never seen a production where anybody did anything with that. The fact that Edgar, or I've never felt it, this is, I've seen Lear, I think, six times, and I never got the sense that the actor, it's written in, because the verse is, it's different, the whole scansion is different, that he plays, Edgar himself drops so Edgar's got Mad Tom, he's got Edgar, he's got Mad Tom. Then he's got this kind of country hick character, because it is written a little bit more peasanty, right, than his, obviously his Edgar, which is very measured and quite well educated, and his Mad Tom, which is adopted nonsensical. This one does have a kind of, with Shakespeare, like a rustic bumpkin feel. So we were just trying, and we tried kind of North Country English, and it didn't really work, because Kent is sort of in a semi-North Country adopted accent. So, and then, I don't know, it just sort of felt, because there is that, it's a miracle, you know? There is, there is some in it that actually does work with the way a kind of um, perhaps person from North Georgia might talk, so that's where we went. Uh, but I do understand that that might be too far. We just, we've decided to stick with it and go that way. <laughs> And the map, um, nobody's fallen. It does, the fact that it moves around is kind of on purpose. You know, we decided that we wanted it to not, because the scene gets all, you know, it's the emotions of the scene get all messed up. So the fact that Lear walks on it first and then everybody else starts walking on it and it moves around, that's actually, we like that. And the actors don't feel at all unsafe out there. And the fact that it, it starts out pristine and, and then becomes a mess and then it gets thrown around is something that, again, we, we decided to go for. And it's partially, again, from seeing too many leers where it's all formal. And I mean, the whole approach to that first scene was to bust up my, my own and Tony's, all of, our, all of our responses as actors to too many, especially Shakespeare Festival leers that start out and there's a very formality thing to that first scene. And, and I just wanted it to feel not that. So it was actually the last dress rehearsal where Tony and I came up with the idea of not giving Regan the crown. And we didn't, we didn't tell the actor. It was very mean of us. But, you know, he, he didn't tell her that he wasn't good. And it was one of those wonderful, totally real moments on stage where, where she was like, ah, oh, my, what am I going to do? Uh, <laughs> um, I especially, I, well, I love the whole production, but The Fool was perfect for me. he was just he looked and sounded and acted exactly right i thought he was wonderful and i thought it was a great idea to have him up in the balcony in that first scene interacting with cordelia that was a really good 
uh, addition to the play. I, I ha there's the script. Th this is a question about the play script. I have a hard time with this uh, Edgar pretending to take his no to take his father up to the cliff, and he's supposed to be. St I mean, thank goodness for the wonderful Shakespearean language, but you know, I'm just thinking this whole long strange thing. Why doesn't he just say, it's me. I'm here. Edgar has come back. I'm going to take care of you. You're going to be okay. Th that is so convoluted. <laughs> so strange. Well, it is strange, but it's, I mean, another, for contemporary audiences who know Samuel Beckett's Waiting for Gatto, it, it's so much like that play. It's, it's like Shakespeare, for me, leaps hundreds of years into the future and imagines a pure existentialist moment. And if you, if you know Waiting for Gatto, it's very similar. You know, they, Dee Dee and Gogo, should we hang ourselves? What should we do? It has an absurdist feel to it. And even, you know, our set, part of the Im inspiration was Gatto with its solo tree, the, the simplicity and starkness of that. And I think that, well, first of all, Edgar can't, he has to, he can't just say he's Edgar. His father has done terrible things. He wants to save his father, but he also wants to put his father through a kind of existentialist exercise to come out on the other end, right? So he concocts this elaborate, you know, we're going up the hill thing. But I do think, again, I think we, and, and even the Southern Preacher part of it, I think in the text there's a humor to that in the sort of way that sometimes Beckett, you know, if you saw Ian McKellen and Patrick Stewart do Beckett in New York, it, it's funny, even though it's awfully desperate. There's this dark humor to it that I think is part of the, you know, part of the thing. Oh, we, we call up the hill, oh my God. It's meant to be a little bit darkly funny. And then when he falls, you know, I, I think that Edgar for a second thinks maybe he had a heart attack. You know, there's a second there where, he, oh my God, did he actually die? Not from a fall, obviously, but from the, the heart attack. So there's a little bit of a sense that he comes back to life as a new person who now, and and it is in the text, I mean, it's interesting that Shakespeare never writes that father-son moment like he does write the daughter-father moment for Lear. He never does it, although Edgar clearly says the word father a couple of times. And we're trying to play it that Gloucester gets it. I mean, I think Gloucester has quite lost his mind in a way, but that he, in that last bit, when he says, who are you, sir? that he understands that this is his son. Well, first of all, congratulations, because this is probably one of my favorite Shakespeare productions I've ever seen. It, it, was, it was edge of your seat, amazing. Um, we actually kept discussing this weekend how, how does the Shakespeare Festival attract a younger audience? And we thought, I mean, I, I kept thinking during your production, this is a perfect production to drag our younger friends that we have a hard time getting them to come um, to watch it because it is edge of your seat exciting. Um, my question though is, was it a deliberate, well, it was a deliberate choice that you made, but why do the death of the three daughters all occur off stage? Shakespeare does that. Okay. It, yeah, it that's his play. Yeah. Why does he Why, do that? Right. I don't know. There are a couple things here where I was, I would love to ask him. You know, even Shakespeare could have used a good dramaturg. <laughs> I love that, so I wanted them to, you know. Yeah. He, it's the way it is. And in the, in the play, he has people drag the bodies back on stage, which would be, again, be very, that's very Jacobean to have all those dead bodies on stage. But, you know, quite frankly, we didn't have the people to do that. And we literally did not have the numbers of people it would require to bring, bring those girls back on all bloody but no that's part of his his thing i wanted to add a comment as well um earlier you mentioned game of thrones and for me i was the language is the clearest for me and i was very edge of my seat and i've seen king lear here before but i remember being partly disengaged during that production 
And this time, he just had my attention the entire time. And I kept telling him, this feels so much like Game of Thrones. It feels so much like Game of Thrones. And at intermission, I looked at him. I'm like, oh my gosh, winter is coming. Winter is coming. <laughs> And um, you talked about the and scene. Jon Snow is dead. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. And the scene where um, Lear is approaching his daughters and they're turning him away because he wants to bring all of his men. What you talked about earlier, I totally felt that. And I just wanted to um, recognize that because I remember also telling him at intermission, I agree with the girls. I don't think that they're being unreasonable. I think that he's being unreasonable. So I thought that delivery was very clear on your part and on the actresses. Thank you. Uh, that's the biggest compliment, you know, because I too have often felt in seeing this play that I've never laughed, and I also have felt like, uh, I know it's a great play, but uh, so I'm thrilled if it if, if that was a goal of mine to get it to play with energy all the way through. And please bring your younger friends. Younger people would like this. My son, I have a 21 year old son who is not a theater person at all, and. You know, I sent him when we were working on the eye gouging scene, I took him an iPhone picture of Jamie and I said, I think you'll like this one. And, you know, because he likes Martin McDonough. That's who his favorite play is, The Lieutenant of Inishmore, which is the bloodiest play I've ever seen. And so he, he gave this one a pass. You know, it's like, yeah, there's enough. There's enough action to keep me listening to all those words. So I do think it would it is one that younger, particularly kind of the 16 to 23 year old set would really appreciate so bring them please did you have a challenge in figuring out where to have the intermission oh, God. and how oh. did you decide that yeah the the play is very hard to break those of you who know it it's a tough one to figure out where that intermission should go and uh, I one of the productions that I actually think is is a very good rendition of the play is available on digital theater which I think if you, you guys don't know that website, it's fabulous. It's an English website. And it's the Jonathan Price version uh, that was the um, Almeida production. Uh, and they made it all the way. They're Brits, so they could talk faster than we can. They made it all the way through the blinding of Gloucester before they took a break. And I liked that. I'd never seen anyone do that. And I thought that makes sense because there is a tonal shift after that. We tried that. <laughs> And we just couldn't make that happen. It was like an hour and 40 minutes. So that was our first attempt. Then we tried it after uh, with, with the scene where um, Edgar and, fool, and the Fool are left on stage, where Edgar has his two lines and then the Fool has his sort of departure shamanistic moment with his rattle. And that one had some benefits to it. Then we got out here and realized the Utah weather, that we needed more darkness for the storm. <laughs> so to be honest, <laughs> the choice was made purely on the fact that if we took the intermission after the, well, I always knew that with the gates slamming, by the way, I'm changing that after the preview last night, because the gates slamming is really the end of the play for the audience there, the end of the act. Even though on a big indoor proscenium, I think you could do something beautiful with the fool and Lear, I don't think out here. So it's just gonna end with the gates slamming. And the audience, I think, if I had gone on from there, would think that was the end anyway. So, right, if you, if you went on from that feels like such a, that is the natural place. It's early in the play, and it wasn't, it was my third choice. But because, and it does get dark by the time we come back for howl, you know, blow winds and crack your cheeks. And it needs to be dark for that. You've got you to gotta do some theatrics. <laughs> so... There's a, a number of things. I love this play. It was absolutely fantastic. And vomiting on stage I hadn't seen, and now I've seen it three times in two days. It's almost, I don't know, it was a thing for a theme for Vomit this. On stage. Yeah, vomiting on stage. Um, we were sitting right there, and after it happened, and it's cleaned up, it's not completely cleaned up, and one of your actors was thrown right into it, face down into it. And I thought, oh, that was, that was perfect. I, I just Yeah, Kent throws Oswald face down into it. Yep. So then aside from the eye being thrown in our direction. <laughs> we did, we did. The, one, of the, one of the daughters was thrown towards the audience. And she, and she stumbled on her way towards the audience. I was like, do I have to catch her? So she actually, and it, there was this. All those little things brought me into the play. I mean, she just, she, 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 um, you know, ran it out. 
I, I don't know if the stumble was deliberate or not, but she was thrown towards the the, the audience, and she kind of ran it out and and caught herself, and it was obvious. And so, I mean, we were talking about it, and it really, really sucked it in. Um, Tony, uh, crying twice in the play. Holy smokes! I, I mean, I don't know how he's going to survive the whole season. Honestly, frankly, the emotions that he put through on that stage was. I mean, almost more than I could bear. I mean, I was crying. I was crying um, for him and then thinking of him as going through that as the actor. I'm like, the empathy for not the character Eve, so much, but the actor that's playing the character was just, you know, kind of amazing. I, I don't really have a question on it. There's a, lot of there's a lot of material that you can take off of, but I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Yes, and we all worried about it being the vomit season, but there you have it. <laughs> so what is the thinking behind having uh, the actual vomit being seen as opposed to having it uh, pantomime? Uh, again, it's, it's kind of like the bloody eye. I mean, I just I think the Jacobean sensibility would go for that and wouldn't have any problem with that. And also, I wanted, again, another thing that I had never really felt in other Lears was just how obnoxious that group of men was. So the image there was a frat party out of control and, you know, and <laughs> they're drunk. So it, it just made sense. And also just to, you know, it, I think it helps Goneril and especially Oswald who becomes, you know, is, is Goneril sort of weird hit man. You know, the fact that the vomit is right at his feet and then Kent puts his face in it. I just think it wouldn't have the effect it had for this gentleman as a pantomime. Um, and that, that it's justified, it's implied in the script. You know, Goneril says as much. You know, your riotous nights, they're, they're here getting drunk. And that would be what it would be like to have those guys in the house. And, you know, the poor staff or poor helper woman there has to walk around cleaning up after them and put up with their pinching her bottom and their rudeness and and all of that I think is part of what's in, in in the text so we just made it graphic art imitating life yeah. I was wondering I was very distracted by the brew fest and all the music the last two nights and I'm wondering how do the actors handle that well you know last night was the last night so the headliner act was the one that came on right when poor Tony is going through all his I thought he was fantastic. I mean, he just kept his concentration. <laughs> and the band kept getting louder and louder as we got softer and, so you know, I don't know how they do it, to be honest. That's very, very hard. Uh, it's hard to access those emotions anyway. Uh, I mean, obviously, it's hard to do that. Uh, and to, to kind of keep it when the band starts, I don't know. But that's the way it is. So it's done now. We don't have to put up with that anymore. <laughs> Any of you who live in Cedar City, ask them if they can. If they just oriented the band shell going the other way, we'd be fine. <laughs> they actually did that, and it used to, used to be louder. No, it, it, it wasn't nearly as bad as it was last okay. year. No. All right. I thought just a really marvelous theatrical moment was when Lear curses Goneril and Melinda Funstein's reaction to that, her expressions, she got tears in her eyes. That was really- Wouldn't you? I mean, good Lord. <laughs> well, the sterility, your womb will never, oh my gosh, it's such awful language. Well, she did it, she did it so well. That was, that was a wonderful moment in the play, I thought. So there were just a few things that um, I've seen a number of productions of Lear that sort of didn't entirely work for me. I think on the on the whole, I loved uh, Tony as Lear. I thought he did an amazing job. Uh, I really liked Edgar. One thing that I really appreciated with the script is a lot of times, I, I think probably for time's sake, uh, the actors try and get as much uh, text out as, as possible, but I felt like that they tried to make the text as clear as possible. Um, but a few things that didn't work for me quite as much. Uh, Oswald with his weird kind of deformed hand, I thought that was kind of distracting for me. And I didn't think it was really necessary for his character. Um, and then the 
kind of echoing when Lear is doing the the blow wind speech. Um, I don't know that that took me a little bit out of it because I, I felt like the the language itself is strong enough. It didn't really need more than like sound effects or wind. Um, so just if you can comment on that. I'm curious about what other people thought of that. I mean, I I uh, I know that's a. I mean, again, that's a choice. We we wanted to make the the uh, the blow winds scene and also the the first the appearance of Mad Tom out of the hovel. Uh, I got intrigued by a lot a lot of uh, directors writing about that section and people going, "Oh, I wish we could stage it." where it felt like the storm was inside Lear's head. So that I got I became very interested in that that the the kind of hyper reality of the fact that the storm is is a literal storm I think but it also is a metaphorical storm. So the uh, the mic effect there is not because we think Tony needs to be louder. It it's just to give it a feeling that's a little bit unearthly, a little bit something that's beyond just realism and the same thing with the first Mad Tom because that is where you really start to see how crazy he is going Lear and so the effect there is to is to make it feel in his mind as well as really happening and we had a discussion last night because I actually, again, I, I think that is something kind of like the eye and like the Southern preacher that's just a decision that some people are going to go, okay, that really worked for me and some people are, are not and I'm just willing to let that stand. But we did have a big discussion last night uh, after at midnight uh, and decided against it. But I had the feeling last night that if I had more previews, I would try it. Um, when Edgar comes on right before the fight, I, I was going to put him back on again so that that whole, the, uh, the exchange that's directly before it where he and his brother are facing off. But the sound design, designer and I decided not to because that we felt, okay, it would be neat in a way, but it would all, it's meant to be real, that fight. It's meant to be, it is what it is. It's the two brothers finally, you know, Cain and Abel dueling it out to the death. And there isn't that element of, hyper reality which at least for us does exist out on the heath i mean to be honest we tried it for a while with the whole thing including the the jamie the gloucester um edgar section the part that's so weird because it is interesting to hear that a little bit it it adds a component to it but we decided it was too much and stuck with the part that's really where lear's brain is really going crazy so what did other people feel how many people felt they were distracted by it? Okay. How many people noticed it? And did you guys, so you guys thought it was interesting? Yeah, you liked yeah. it. I liked the choice, but as soon as it happened, I lost the language. I noticed it almost like up until that moment, I was like, what are you saying? And then once it happened, I liked the effect. And I was like, what are you Did it change at all during it? Do you remember? Because we were at, like playing with levels during the whole thing. We were trying to find the place. Did did it get better in the in the hovel scene? Yeah. Got harder. I had to you had to concentrate. Well, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Leaning in is okay, but yeah, yeah, it's a little bit of problem. We don't quite have enough previews here to get, you know, it's hard to try those things here. We were up till one thirty trying to do lights, and because we don't really have time to most of the plays. If you see Henry and Shrew, they're fairly straightforward in terms of lighting and theatrical effects, so it's tricky. But we're still trying to find that place where you do get the echo, but the language is clear. And somewhat the actors have to understand how much to enunciate. They really have to enunciate like crazy. And they're, they're trying to find that balance. Uh, I just wanted to say the same thing. I had wondered, because the, the intermission at the place where it came really led into that. And at the time, I wondered, because I kept saying, wow, we're not too far into the play, and there's an intermission already. And then You get, worried, right? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, wait a minute. What's going to happen now? Uh, but uh, then when it came on with the next scene, I said, oh, because that was the obvious place for the, for the intermission, because now they've moved to a whole different setting. They're on top of the mountain and I thought the echo thing was just brilliant because I kept saying how did they do that and I didn't find it 
I didn't find it more difficult to, to understand. In fact, I think I probably understood it better. And we were getting groove fest, so it was hard to separate. There was, at the time, there was a kind of backbeat going yeah. on, so it was hard, but that, that's good. Yeah. And yeah, that it, the, again, the good thing about the intermission there is the play does move from basically indoors to basically outdoors at that point. From there on, most of the scenes are and exterior on top of the scenes. mountain. On top, yep. Mm -hmm. And did you want to respond to the to Drew Shirley's um, oh, the decision? Hand? Yes. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I, again, I, I just he came up with that choice, and I thought it was an interesting one. Um, uh, we worked hard once we did it. Uh, we were worried that I mean, here's a backstory to it. This is very weird, but um, another student of mine who has worked here before at the festival. Uh, was offered the role, and he actually is missing a hand. And he couldn't take the contract. It was heartbreaking for him because he's on contract with the National Theater Company, which is touring, and he was going to miss the four, first four days of rehearsal, eight months of work, and they wouldn't, they wouldn't let him out, and he couldn't break his contract. So he didn't do the part. And I never said anything to Drew about this. Never. He never knew that I mean, Drew was, I think, already hired because he's a wonderful actor, but he got the part. And he's never know. you guys know this, but he doesn't, that the actor who I had talked about is actually naturally missing a hand. And then he came up with the idea, and maybe because it was so karmically in sync with, I was like, that is really strange. And it's actually the same hand. Who, who asked, who did that? You use that, yeah. It's the same hand. So I just sort of thought, well, that must be meant to be. And, and I thought, I love his Oswald, because again, that's a character that sometimes you can forget. And his devotedness to Goneril, I just thought it sort of worked for the character. But we had to work very hard because Kent beats up on Oswald so much. And the first dress rehearsal, I thought, oh my gosh, Oswald, because he's now a person with this physical handicap, and Kent seemed like such a bully. You know, we had to kind of retweak the fights to, to make sure that everybody understood that Oswald is no victim, that he's a, a vicious, mean, awful person who will knife anybody in the back. So we've had to work with the handicap. And at that point, it was so much a part of his character, quite frankly, that I couldn't, I just felt, okay, I can't, I can't get rid of this. But we have been, just so you know, tweaking how we feature it, you know, and trying to just make it a part of who he is and psychologically a part of why he's so he's a one dog you know animal he he has goneril and that's it and anything she wants he will do uh and he has nothing else in his mind except for her and what she wants until regan tries to influence him get in there yep all right sitting Well, and at least it made you notice this character, right? So it's a character that sometimes can go completely without notice. So that's good. Uh, sitting all the way in the back of the orchestra, um, I felt that we had uh, trouble uh, with Tony enunciating in different portions because uh, a lot of the stuff I said, what did he say, you know? And I don't know if it was a projection thing or whether it had to do with the festival, with the music in the back or whatever. But um, I, I just felt that we... That, that we missed a lot of the dialogue back there. Yeah, we're, I mean, Phil uh, Thompson, who's the vocal coach, we have a ton of notes for Tony. Some of it might have been the music. It's a little hard to know because when you do have that kind of ambient sound. But yeah, and it is very, it's a, it's a, he knows it, that enunciation, it's not usually volume with him, it is enunciation. And as we all know, those of us who are emotional people, when you get emotional, you often, you know, physically, it's very hard to enunciate. So it's one of the hardest actor things to do is to be where you need to be emotionally and technically enunciate with the clarity that you need to do. So he's going to be working on that. And to be honest, I mean, this is one of the huge roles of all time. And you, 
you know, you have to accept the fact as an actor that you're going to be working the whole summer and you're still not going to, there's never going to be a performance where you've absolutely hit every single emotional note 100% and know that you have enunciated every single word. It's just never going to happen. It's, you know, like a professional athlete where you have to accept the fact that you, you drop the football sometimes and, you know, whatever, and you just have to keep going. But he's getting, he's getting continual notes about that. He himself is very attentive to it. And the other thing is we've all had terrible allergies this year, more than usual. You know, the pollen has just been, yeah, so he's in the heat. So he's suffering a bit from, he's in there doing the neti pot all the time because his sinuses have been bothering him. So that's made it worse. Not to apologize for him, but just to tell you, we, we've all had, we've had to, you know, sit with vaporizers and try to get the gunk out of our sinuses. Also, some of the actions going up the aisle, uh, we were sitting on the right side all the way in the back, and Eric came whipping up, and I think maybe 20 people at most saw what he did. You know, you know, he fainted uh, throwing up or something, and I said, We, well, we want to well, kind of bury him. We that. don't... <laughs> Yeah, we, we're fine with only 20 people seeing that. The lucky 20 who get him almost. We were, we were lucky then. <laughs> yeah. Joe, so, um, in the costume design of the show, the entire design of the show uh, is sparse and very evocative, I felt. Um, did you, did Rachel bring you the ideas? Did you have a, a color palette in mind for the entire show and particularly for the uh, the appearance of the sisters. Well, we have to give credit to the Game of Thrones costume designer. I mean, again, the sisters look, we actually had to keep tweaking that so that they didn't look too much like, you know, what's her name, the blonde, Circe, but with the armor and with the long kimono style sleeves that particularly Goneril's look is really influenced by her look. Um, and the, uh, so are, I mean, the winter is coming, you know, the, the kind of heavy, leathery, very masculine look is, is again, I mean, you know, that's, that's a look that was, would be prevalent in a very Northern climate, but it is, we were looking a lot at the Jon Snow, the watch, you know, just what kind of layers of leather that costume designer was using to get that that it's just a very masculine, very rough, heavy, it's hot as heck out there in those clothes. It's real leather. Um, and we wanted uh, the women to stand out. We wanted the color palette to be very neutral, very dark, very earth toned, except for the three sisters who, who pop out uh, color wise. So that was all. And luckily they all actually do have different hair colors. Uh, Kelly, that is her real hair. The other two have wigs on, but those are their, colors you know they're one's a blonde one's a sort of reddish haired and kelly has that beautiful black hair so we were blessed with the casting that they actually look quite different also reflective of the emotional content of the play the drab the the darkness the heaviness all of that in, informed i would think what you were going for yeah and one of the the sort of un unexpectedly comedic things because uh, we only really, it's, it's a lot of people on stage, but it's also not quite enough to do a play like this because you have, at the end, opposing armies. And we had five people, and we were just dying of laughter, you know, because we had to keep changing the roles around because it got to be very funny. You know, Eric Weeman would show up murdered in one scene, and then he'd be back on stage, <laughs> and we're trying to disguise who that person is. And it became like a Monty Python routine, you know, like the knights who say nyt. You know, they kept coming... <laughs> and poor Alex, who's one of the younger actors, a student here, at one point was the Herald, and I had to take the part away from him and give it to wonderful John Aileen at a certain point, because I just said, Alex, I've seen you too much out there. You cannot come back in again, <laughs> and we haven't seen John for a while, so let's get him out there. <laughs> um, I, I just want to uh, kind of join in a little bit with uh, saying that uh, of, of the many a little louder please oh sorry of, of the many productions I've seen uh, I think this might be the one where I, I had the most sympathy for the, the the sisters at the beginning which is great where you know when especially in the scene with 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 Goneril 
I, th- I think it makes perfect sense to have Lear's soldiers completely out of control because it reflects Lear's behavior as being out of control and excessive and and too much. Uh, and you touched a little bit on it, like how how much of the way that uh, Regan and Goneril behave is because of you know their their perceived and real injuries at Lear's hands and his increasingly unreasonable behavior and how much of it is their their real nasty personalities coming through uh you know when it at the right opportunity it's also very difficult with i think it's i, I think any production with uh is edgar's the bastard is that right Ed, or Ed, 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 sorry, I I, it's hard to it's. I I'm, mix them up. Edmund, well, well, Edmund's the bastard. Well, so. I'm I'm terrible with names too. It's it's really hard not to make Edmund this mustache twirling villain because for, despite everything he says about, well, wow, this is completely unfair. Everything he does is so evil, and the language seems to lend itself to him just almost saying, "I'm so clever, and I'm re- ruining all these trusting people's lives." Uh, I mean, could you talk a little bit about how do you you know? Uh, in this play, in particular, like how much of what these characters do is justified by their by their circumstances? How much of it is is them justifying what they're doing because of their circumstances? And how do you play that in a realistic way? Well, I think you know the in the beginning. I'm going to talk about Lear first. In the beginning, in the first scene, Lear is rash, narcissistic, bullying. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of some other qualities, but those three qualities at least. And one of the things that we were working for is that the fruit can't fall too far from the tree. Eventually, the sisters exhibit their genetic qualities, right? They finally take on, by the end, when they're pushing him out of the house, they're narcissistic, bullying, you know, and rash. But they don't start out that way, right? So that's the journey for them. Uh, Edmund, again, yeah, I just, I'm just not, I mean, first of all, everybody loves the bad guy, right? We do love the fact that Edmund's probably one of the smarter people out there. And he's definitely in control where other people are making rash decisions. He's making very calculated decisions. So it's fun to watch his brain work is what I was, what Brendan and I were going for is, and then eventually he becomes narcissistic rash i mean once he starts to realize that oh my god i'm actually getting power and now i'm getting both girls he he starts to be he goes over the edge so he doesn't take the threat seriously you know from the guy coming in and he makes he makes some fatal rash mistakes he he can't maintain his rational behavior once ambition lust all those other things really kick in with him but he doesn't, again, start out that way. He starts out feeling, I think, uh, an opportunity and a drive because he's been sent away. It's there in the, I've been sent away nine years. He's been kind of sent off. And he comes back with a chip on his shoulder and a, and a desire to get what he feels is rightfully his. Um, and that's, I think, all he wants in the beginning. And then it just starts to, as he gets it, he starts to have fun with it, and then the 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 baser instincts start to fully take over with him. Okay, <laughs> so Cordelia says in the beginning, "I know who you are," to these two sisters. So, you know, I think I don't see them taking a journey. I think that they're already there is some real evil there and by the time you get to participating in gouging out the eyes <laughs> yeah <laughs> so it that it's still it begins as pleated cunning or plighted cunning in the mm-hmm. in the text that's what cordelia says she doesn't i know who you are i know you who you are you're cunning you've made a cunning move here that doesn't necessarily mean they're you know, the hellacious creatures they become. To me, they, they do, they lie. They overplay their hand with their dad. But again, I mean, I might do that if my father said, here, no, tell me you love me. No, I don't you're know. not going to gouge out anybody. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> no. And one of the things I was, I mean, you've mentioned Cordelia, and I don't get to talk about her, because I that is one of the decisions 
I knew that Kelly would be great in this play. I had actually thought of her for Regan because I because she has such strength and she's sexy and you know beautiful. And I thought, oh, that'd be a, she'd be a cool Regan. And David and uh, uh, Brian, when they were they they had seen her audition work before uh, and had always liked her. And they said, oh, we really like her. And then they saw her audition and they said, why don't you think of her as Cordelia? And I. As again a female director, I went oh, because uh, Cordelia is often played cast as the sort of young ingenue, right? A, a different type of actress than Kelly is. And when they said that, they said, you know, she has a strength where you could really believe she can lead the French army, which is what she does in the play and what you don't often believe. And I was like, great idea, you guys, because that is a really unusual way to see that character. You know, doing a sword fight, uh, being that kind of having that kind of strength. And you know, I've always seen her blonde. So Absolutely, that, she's almost always was, blonde. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. One final comment. Did you, sir? Yes. yes. Yeah. The microphone's coming. I try to see something that's current. You know, and in this day and age. Hold the mic. When I come to the Shakespeare Festival, I like to see something that's current. And and I don't doubt, I don't wonder why Lear wouldn't wonder if his children loved him or not. In this day and age where they're trying to destroy the family, you're not sure. And there's some, I have a son that was raised away from me. So naturally, I wonder if he loves me. The natural love of a father for a son or grandfathers for their grandchildren, there's a natural love there. That, you know, nieces and nephews, they kind of ignore me a little bit most of the time. But my own children, my own grandchildren, even grandchildren, I'm as worried about them as I am my own children. So the one son, I, I've been very kind to him because I know what he's been through with a divorce. Mm -hmm. See, so so I I was mostly touched by the ending scene where um, King is uh, King Lear is holding Cordelia and he realizes what he's done. He's 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 expected too much out of her. I have a daughter. I expect her to love me and take care of me. I took care of my mom, but I don't expect her to love me like a girlfriend or something, you know. <laughs> but but I just like, you know, I dearly love grandparents because they were so good to me. And you need kids, you know, you need that closeness when you're growing up. So, so yeah. my point is there's no did you get all of that? people? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, you can't get rid of the family. Most well, important. I think I think Shakespeare totally agrees with you. You can't get rid of the family. <laughs> I think he would totally agree with that, no matter how much you might want to. <laughs> well, on that note, Sharon Ott, thank you so much for being with us this morning. And thank you all for being here. We'll take a quick break and come back to talk about South Pacific with director Brad Carroll.